Hello, Houston. You'll remember that last time we had just finished talking about um, the last of the major developed tests of intelligence, those by Robert Sternberg and, and associates. Um, and today what we're going to do is start looking at what the factors are that actually impact intelligence. And given that we are in psychology, the answer is relatively straightforward. One factor is heredity and the other is environment. And we're going to look a little bit at each of those and give you some hints as to how, how we study it and what the, what the general effect actually is. So in essence, we're going to start with looking at the factors that, that impact intelligence and start specifically with heredity. The, um, the genetic relationship and, and its impact on, on intelligence uh, has been investigated a whole lot of times down through the years. One investigator whose work we'll look at here in a few minutes has probably had more unfortunate impact on the area than any other. Um, but we'll get to that here in just a minute. The concept we're going to talk about is what's called heritability. And that refers basically to um, the amount of variability in a trait that is due to genetic differences among the, the individuals in that population. In other words, the extent to which uh, that factor is, is impacted by the heredity of the, of the people who are, are um, producing children, in essence. The general concept is illustrated by this um, data. And in essence, this is the data that I was suggesting has been somewhat biased by the, by the research. This is the work of Sir Cyril Burt, B-U-R-T, um, who died about a decade ago, uh, perhaps a little more by now, given my memory. <coughs> the difficulty with this data and with Burt's work is the fact that late in his career, perhaps five, ten years before his, uh, his demise, word began to circulate around or suspicions began to be raised about some of the work that he had done. He was a dyed-in-the-wool hereditist, if we could use that word, but he was very convinced that, that heredity was the only major determinant of IQ. And there is some considerable evidence now available to suggest that some of the correlations that he reported were actually jimmied or altered in some way artificially or perhaps uh, achieved by throwing out cases that disagreed. I mean, there are several different ways to bias data and make it come out the way it's supposed to. Um, one of the typical examples was the fact that in one instance it was reported that work that was separated by as much as 30 years where he had studied the same variable in studies that were separated by three decades, he ended up reporting correlations like 0.444 identical to the third decimal place. In any of psychology that is very rare and certainly in an area that is, is as slippery as considering the hereditary impact on intelligence, it's essentially impossible to achieve correlations like that and to replicate them. Uh, I mean, the correlation is okay, but replicating it 30 years later to the third decimal place begins to raise some fairly serious questions. That having been said, the underlying premise of this data, nonetheless, I suspect is a legitimate one. <coughs> and in essence, what's depicted here is, is the, the impact of increasing correlation or, or closeness genetically is perhaps a better way to say it. That is, at the top of the screen what you see is the, the range of correlations that has been reported in studies um, talking about or measuring two people who are unrelated and raised in different environments. Um, and when they are tested, there is a slight positive correlation. The reason for that is actually very straightforward to point out, and that is the fact that, that we can't test below an IQ of about 25 simply because, you know, the people who are, are that intellectually challenged don't understand the importance of trying to do well, in fact probably don't even understand the instructions that are given to them. And because of that we lose the ability to test at the very low end of the IQ range. So the effect of that is that if you're out walking on the street and, and put into a, an IQ study of some sort, by definition your correlation, your IQ is going to correlate something above zero with anybody else who's in the, in the, in the group randomly selected, simply because the very lowest of the low in terms of ability will not be in the group at all. So it's going to push the correlation slightly positive. When they're reared together, when two randomly selected people are reared together, you'll notice that the correlation jumps up on average to about 0.25. What you see on the graph there, the line indicates the, the, um, the, the range of studies and the X in the middle of the line is the, is the average for the studies that were cited in this summary study. And it goes all the way up to the other end of the scale where you've got 
identical twins, that is twins created with um, one sperm and one egg, um, who are either reared apart or reared together. And when you look at the top, the highest degree of correlation, you are right at the limits of the testing ability of an IQ test or the test retest reliability of an IQ test. So in that case, the, the correlation actually makes it look as though the average correlation is up around 0.92, very close to perfect. And what's being done there is to test the IQ of one twin and then use that to predict the IQ of the other twin. And in essence, you're at or above the test retest limits of a test at that, at that level. And so the net result is, the, uh, the idea is that if we test one twin and use that test to guess the IQ of the other twin, we won't be essentially any more accurate if we then go ahead and test them and use the test instead to predict that second twin's IQ. So in essence, you've reached the upper limits of the reliability of the, um, of the test. When you re test two identical twins who have been reared apart, circumstances occasionally suggest that that will, uh, will happen. The correlation jumps down to around 0.8. Um, the difference between the two, one could argue, as Bert did, is attributable to hereditary differences. And in essence, you can see there that he's attributing a relatively small impact to hereditary differences in, uh, I'm sorry, to environmental indifferences is what I should have said. I hope I spoke correctly. The difference between the, the bottom two sets of data is attributable to environmental differences, not to hereditary differences. That is the little bit that he was willing to concede might be attributable to environmental impacts on one's IQ. The net result is that, that this data, unfortunately, has been very widely cited down through the years, and there's reason to suspect now that it isn't as rosy as the, the graph would suggest it is, that perhaps we need to look other places to find, um, um, identify the precise impact of heredity on um, IQ. So in fact, let's also then look at various studies that have impacted environment, and I think you will be amazed to see the kind of differences that we find. One of the first variables that has been looked at in terms of what is the impact on, on a person's IQ is to look at age. Does it have any impact on, on age, uh, on IQ, I should say? Does age have an impact on IQ? Do we get smarter? Am I brilliant simply because I'm older than most of you who are listening and viewing? Um, or am I, in fact, dumber? on average than most of you who are listening or, or viewing. I'm sure at various times during the semester you've had various opinions on that, um, on that issue. But in essence, the answer is that it turns out it depends, the answer to that question depends on how we actually measure IQ. Shai and Struther did quite an interesting series of studies on, on the impact of age on IQ. One of the very first studies they did involved getting groups of 50 people at each of 10 different age levels from 20 up through age, um, and I'll, let me look at the graph here. In essence, what they're doing here is a cross-sectional um, study. And they actually had people that ranged from 25 to 70 years of age. Um, so they had 10 groups of 50 each, 50 25-year-olds, 50 30-year-olds, and so forth, all the way up to 50 70-year-olds. They tested each group. And in essence, the cross-sectional measure gave this kind of an, uh, a statistical measure of IQ as a function of age. That's bad news for us old fogies. But let me just remind you of what is called a cohort effect. If you remember back in developmental psychology, we talked about a cohort effect, which is basically the fact, what, it, what, it's basically, uh, what it's based on is the idea that each of us in our generation has a unique living experience. Um, my generation includes, for instance, the Vietnam conflict when I was in my 20s. Um, most of you were not even alive at the time the Vietnam conflict was going on, yet it's had a major impact on our, uh, on our generation. I was alive when Kennedy was assassinated um, on um, November 11th of 1963, which date I will remember forever. Um, those are the kind of things, what did I say, the 11th? It was 1122. It was the 22nd of November. See, it goes with age. <laughs> well, so much for making the point I was going to make. <laughs> um, the point is that there is, first of all, a cohort effect that we really need to take into account. And one of the major effects that would have this kind of detrimental effect on IQ as a function of age is quality of education. And there is good evidence to suggest that the quality of education has gone steadily upward in this country down through the years. You are better educated now than your parents were when they were as old as you are now. And both of you were better educated at the age that you are now 
than your grandparents were when they were as old as you are now. So that the quality of education has been going steadily upward. Our ability to impact people with, with um, fancy new mechanisms and television and, and all sorts of illustrative materials and teaching devices and curriculum and everything has steadily improved. So there is some possibility that in fact older people were not less well educated for their time, but that the total knowledge base that was packed into them to work with was smaller than what you have to work with, what you have to work with is the way I should enunciate that. So that in turn actually led Shai and Struther to go back several years later and do a very clever follow-up to the original study. What they did was to track down about six, five or six years later, about 70% of the people who had originally participated in this study, the data of which we see on the screen here now, and in essence what they did instead was a longitudinal study. Now this is not a pure longitudinal study as you'll see here in a minute, but in essence what they did was to retest about 70%, between 60 and 70% of the ones that had been tested five or six years earlier, and then they created the following kind of a graph. Now this is not truly a longitudinal measure, it is actually what's called a linked longitudinal control. Because the one difference was that what they did with the, with the test score they got, instead of just plotting, okay, this is what the 35-year-olds did, this is what the 40-year-olds did. In each case, what they did was to ask of the data, okay, what was the average IQ level for the 35-year-old group five years ago? What is it now? And so where the data point is plotted for the 35-year-olds five years later is anchored on where were they five years earlier. So if the average IQ is higher, five years later for the group that's retested, then the point goes up. If it's lower for the group, then it goes down. So in essence, each is a link from one unit to the next, and it's therefore called a linked longitudinal control. But in essence, you'll see, much to my relief, the data looks quite different when we do it in this way. And what this is arguing is that, that our IQ does in fact improve with age which you would expect. I mean, to the extent that, that IQ taps into one's general knowledge level and experience in using that knowledge, you would largely expect that, in fact, the, the IQ would improve with age. And that's what the longitudinal measure suggests. And that is that, that up to about age 60 or 65, IQ is climbing slowly but steadily through the years. And there's good evidence to suggest that the only reason it actually tails off for the, for the last two groups, this, the 65 and the 70 year olds, is basically a loss of interest or, or motivation. That is, by the time you're 70 years old, you give a rip what your IQ is. It's too late to alter it, and, and you've already lived the good life anyway. Um, so that there are, there are, there's likely suspicion that there are motivational problems that might account for the drop off even in the, in the later years. So I feel mightily relieved and much brighter now than I did after reading the first part of that, um, of that study. There's an environmental factor. I mean, it is purely and simply the fact that as we age, things happen to our IQ, and that is clearly an environmental impact. Let me show you another one, and that is family circumstances. Um, a, a Robert Zions at the University of Michigan has done a very challenging, interesting series of studies over the years in which what he's been able to do is to demonstrate that birth order also impacts your IQ. I've had a lot of trouble convincing my younger sister of the truth of this. But in essence, what Zions was able to indicate is that birth order impacts you in the following way. The older you are, the earlier born you are in a family, the brighter you will tend to be. Okay? The brighter you will tend to be. Okay? Earlier born are brighter in a family. Okay? If you're fifth born in a family of five, you are not as bright as if you were first born in a family of five believe it. Okay? I keep reminding my younger sister. Secondly, it turns out family size also impacts IQ. The point there being that if you're second born in a family of two, you will be smarter on average than you will be if you are second born in a family of five. Okay? So family size works detrimentally on IQ. The bigger the family, the lower the average IQ for the kids that are, that are raised in that family situation. And thirdly, spacing also turns out to impact IQ. Specifically, what this is saying is that if there's a 10-year gap between any two children, the clock starts over again. So if, if, if there are two older children and then a 10-year gap and another child comes along, um, that child's IQ will be as bright as the original firstborn in that family on average. Okay? Now the obvious question is how or why? 
And the answer that Zions and his group came up with is a rather interesting one, and I think it, it, it is legitimate. The point is that basically, when you are first born, you, br you come into a family that has two, on average, 100 IQ adults that interact with each other, except when they're talking to you. And the net result in that situation then is that, they, that you, as, as, a, as a youngster, are being stimulated at a higher intellectual level than happens to your next younger sibling whether brother or sister, because any time that younger brother or sister is listening to what's going on in the family interaction-wise, part of that interaction is your parents talking to you. And so the net result is they have to talk down to you at age two or three, whatever you are. And because of that, the intellectual environment in which that second child exists is actually slightly diluted relative to the, to the one that the firstborn enjoyed. And the, the factor only increases, the weight of that only increases the further down you are in the family order. So in essence, what Zions is arguing, and it does actually explain all three of the variables that I, that I uh, indicated there, is essentially that um, the, the average intellectual environment into which you are born, to a certain extent, determines what your IQ will ultimately be. Now, before those of you who are second, third, or fourth born get too worried about it, recognize that what we're dealing with here is a study that was based on the study of a quarter million families, okay? And the IQ differences that were found were on the order of half an IQ point, okay? Between a third and a half an IQ point. So they achieved statistical significance because of the size of the sample, not because of the magnitude of the differences, okay? So it was using kind of a shotgun to kill a flea in, in demonstrating this basically and it's not something you need to walk around if you're second, third or fourth born and feel actively dumb about because there's only a one or two IQ point difference that has ever been demonstrated in this kind of a situation. Um, there's another um, um, way to, to measure this and in fact what I'd like to do now um, as, we, as we get into this and before I explain what I want to do here, what I want to do actually is to test your IQ. So you've got on, on your simple psych book there, you've got a, a space to indicate um, your responses to each of three questions in two different IQ tests that I want to, um, that I want to share with you. So we're going to measure your IQ in a couple of ways here. Um, and again, this is an individual assessment technique here. So if you share your answers or pool your knowledge with somebody else, we're going to split the IQ points that the two of you earn. Okay, so play it straight when you, uh, when you do it here. Test one, item one. 36 is to 6, as 81 is to blank. 36 is to 6, as 81 is to blank. Question 2. How many white stripes are there on the American flag? How many white stripes are there on the American flag? And number 3. Deathly silence in the studio here now, I notice. What state borders Indiana on the west? What state borders Indiana on the west? Now, if you're feeling pretty cocky, now let's try another test. Same way, three items. Answer the following questions for me. First one, which word is out of place here? Splib, blood, gray, spook? or black? Which word is out of place here? Splib, blood, gray, spook, or black? Number two, hully gully, which is a dance form. Hully gully comes from East Oakland, Fillmore, Watts, Harlem, or Motor City. Hully gully comes from East Oakland, Fillmore, Watts, Harlem, or Motor City? And number three, who did Stagger Lee kill in the famous blues song? His mother, Frankie, Johnny, his girlfriend, or Billy? Who did Stagger Lee kill in the famous blues song? His mother, Frankie, Johnny, his girlfriend, or Billy? Now we're going to go back and score it for you and see how, how well you did. 36 is to 6 as 81 is to 9. Very good. You're right on target so far. 150 IQ minimum. Number 2. Um, I forgot the question. 
<laughs> how many white stripes are there on the American flag? And that would be six, not 13. Remember I said white stripes, not stripes. Do you know what those represent, by the way? The, the original 13 colonies. The, the, what, the stripes represent the original 13 colonies. And finally, what state borders Indiana on the west? Illinois, yes. The pause there is one of the reasons we now require geography for a high school degree in, in, uh, in Texas. Clearly you need some additional help there. Okay, so you're fat and sassy so far, huh? Let's try the other test. This is derived from the Chitlin test, which was published in the New Republic in 1967, and it had a very interesting reason for coming into existence. One of the arguments that was raised about the Stanford Binet, as we commented on the previous program, is the fact that there was no performance component, and worse than that, the knowledge that was being tested was anchored very heavily in middle class experience. One of the questions that is on that test um, and it has only one scorable correct answer, is what color is a banana? And the only allowable correct answer is yellow. But if you live in the core city where bananas eventually end up, you are much more likely to see bananas when they are at least speckled brown or speckled brown black or brown or black before they actually arrive on the, on the grocery store counter in that area of the, of the city, the economically um, disadvantaged area. So although this looks like a racial test, in fact, it's actually based on, on economic experience, core city experience. And the tests then are, are items, the items from this test are drawn from core city experience. Specifically, which word is out of place? Splib, blood, gray, spook, or black? It is the word gray. And gray in black English is the only word that refers to whites. The other four words in standard black English refer to, are various words referring to blacks. Secondly, hully gully, which is a dance form. Does it come from East Oakland, Fillmore, Watts, Harlem, or Motor City? The answer is Watts. And finally then, who did Stagger Lee kill in the famous blues song? His mother, Frankie, Johnny, his girlfriend, or Billy? And the answer there is Billy. Now comes the hard part. You have to score the items. Okay? We're going to score each test separately. And we're going to assume that if you miss none on a given test, we estimate your IQ as being at more than 130 and requiring additional testing. Okay? If you miss one test on an item, on, a, on a, one item on a test, then your IQ is 110. If you miss two of the three items, then your IQ is 90. And if you miss all three items, your IQ is 70 or lower and still in need of further tests to assess how bad it actually is. Now, given that, which kind of a test would you rather have? The first type or the second type if you need to take one for a job interview? The first, clearly. And the reason is that most of us viewing the tapes here and in class are middle class. And therefore, we've had a kind of a broader range of experience than in the average youngster who's trapped in, in the core city somewhere. Less opportunities to go to museums, to concerts, to you name it, in terms of cross-section of experiences. And the result is that we don't have the experience that you get when you're living on the streets in the core city. And so we don't do as well as middle class citizens as somebody who's lived in the core city or in the ghetto and is poor. Those were the kind of experiences that they would tend to have. And that was the point of the, uh, of the test. So although I tease you a little bit with an estimate of your IQ, the fact is that, that the, uh, the second test would not be an effective measure for the IQ of most of us because it hasn't been standardized on the type of experience that most of us have had. That's a fairly important issue in the, um, in the assessment of, of uh, tests. One of the key elements that has stirred up over the last third of a century is the issue of racial differences in intelligence. Arthur Jensen, starting in the late 60s, started raising a real firestorm of, of protest against the idea that, that um, his assertion that blacks have an IQ on average 11 to 15 points below that of the average white. A lot of issues, a lot of research has been cranked out of that, uh, that early assertion. And there are a number of different responses that are now offered, which I think pretty well blunt um, Jensen's original argument. One is the difficulty in defining what you mean by race. Because I can show you papers, authorities, who will cite that there is anywhere from one major race to as many as 11 different races. So what do you actually mean by race? And as soon as you define what you mean by it, I can find somebody that fits right on the line halfway between. What do you do then? 
randomly assign them one side or the other. That's one issue. A second is, is measurement issues relating to the fact that, that um, black English is just as rich and just as abstract as standard American English, but the tests are not cast in black English. So if you're raised in, you know, in an environment where black English is the standard language, you're at an immediate disadvantage linguistically um, because of the, the, um, the langu the, 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 that on which the test is actually based. Question. Can you define what you mean by black English? Black English, I'm not going to do it here because we covered it in the language section of the course, but in essence it is a standard, well-identified form of language that a subset of people in the U.S., particularly in the U.S., tend to speak. It has a, a unique verb form. One example of where it differs, for instance, from standard English, uh, standard American English, is the fact that standard American English is one of the major languages in the world that does not have double negation. I do not love you. The key word in that sentence is not. In black English, that statement would be, I don't love you, no how. In other words, there is a second negation in it, which is the standard rules that are involved. And that actually makes it a safer language for communication purposes. What is the, the group of people that speak black English? I want to know. Well, again, that's a side issue, and I'd rather handle it with you off camera later. But it is, a, it, is a, it is an identified linguistic form that psycholinguists do study. But it's a side issue to the point that I'm trying to make here. Okay. I'll come back to it and handle it with you after class if you'd like. Thirdly, um, why should we blame genetics in, in, the, in the situation where um, one study was done in which 71 black and white children and families were identified and matched very closely for the age of the children being tested, for their sex, for the grade and education level that not only they had achieved but their parents. And the net result was that the, the, um, the IQ point differences that traditionally are found were reduced by about 70% um, in, um, in that situation. A fourth issue has to do with the race of the test administrator. The point being that, that um, um, any time you and I are tested in a cross-race situation, we are at an immediate disadvantage. Um, cross-race testing tends to lead to lower uh, performance and, and because most of the testers traditionally are white rather than black, it tends to put anybody at a dis at a, in a, of a different race at a disadvantage. That is gradually being corrected, uh, but was not the case at, at the time that, that Jensen was raising most of his arguments to begin with. And finally, in essence, the, the biggest difficulty that we have is that what we're doing here is looking at phenotypic differences and trying to attribute genotypic causes to the the differences that actually exist. That, by any other means, is just bad science. Um, now, let's look then at the final type of tests and, and skim through, um, or at least get started in, in looking at um, personality tests. Um, when we look at tests of personality, um, finally, what we are looking at then are, are a variety of different um, uh, types of tests, quite different from the, the tests of intelligence and so forth that, we have, um, that we've studied so far. Relative to, uh, to personality tests, um, there are several points that need to be made. For many of these tests, there is no right as opposed to wrong answer that are publishable or confirmable as we've talked about it previously. Secondly, there may be differences in, in, in reasons for particular answers. Um, and much more emphasis here is normally put on the pattern of answers rather than a particular answer to one item. By contrast, IQ tests are scored item by item by item. In general, personality tests are scored looking at the pattern of answers across the entire test rather than specific answers. Thirdly, the development of personality tests shares many of the same goals um, that are, that are uh, concerned with validity, reliability, standardization, and efficiency, as is true of each of the other types of tests. So in that way, they're quite similar to the other forms of tests that we've described. Another has to do with the, the similar means that are, that are used for measuring um, things like emotions, motivational differences, interpersonal skills or, or differences, and, and attitudes and, and characteristics, attitudinal characteristics. Um, each of these are the kind of things that are the subject of almost all of the personality tests. So they share those, those goals in, in common. Um, these personality tests um, depend both in format and in usage largely on the personality theory on which they are based. And because of that, it is very difficult to, to discuss these tests in the absence of anchoring them in the personality theory on which they are based. 
So unlike some of the other tests where they are quite general, these tests in general tend to be anchored to specific theories of personality. Not always, but frequently so. Um, another issue concerns why these, these uh, tests are actually being given and the, the situations, the reason for doing so vary as widely as, as the testing situation itself. In some instances we're trying to identify people who have a good personality for, for front office kind of job. In other cases we're trying to identify the existence of anxiety and, and what drugs may need to be applied or therapy is needed. Um, in other cases we're trying to eliminate nervous people from security jobs and so forth. So in essence there are a wide variety of possible reasons why these um, why these tests may need to be um, made or uh, are, are actually utilized. Um, another has to do with what, what constitutes uh, typical performance and, and the, the point there is that these are usually tests not of extreme performance but of typical performance. That is in the long run what we're measuring in personality tests is our typical performance rather than the, the extreme performances that may be measured in certain other kinds of ability tests for instance. And finally then there is basically no way to check on whether the subject tells the truth, or at least that is an issue. Okay? There is great incentive for most of us to appear particularly bright when we're taking an IQ test. There is not necessarily that incentive in, in personality tests, and worse, we don't necessarily have any particular way to test whether somebody is in fact answering truthfully or not. Net result then is that we're going to talk about testing personality and I haven't even defined that for you yet. So what I'm going to do here is give you a tentative definition of personality for now and we'll cover it when we get into the personality section. Um, it's the total makeup of the individual is one way to define it. Another way to define it is essentially his or her pervasive identity. That's another way to think of personality. And a third way is to think of it in terms of what is the impact that each of us has on other students, other, other people, other individuals. So each of those, we, we're going to review those later and put them in a broader context when we get into, um, into the study of personality itself. But for now, let's just use that as an operating definition of what we're testing with these kinds of, of tests. Now, in personality tests, there are certain kinds of problems that, that crop up. One of them has to do with administrative issues, and these include, for instance, the need to establish rapport with the subject. You need to make sure that you're, 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 you're on the same wavelength as the person who is being tested. Secondly, um, you need to make sure that the procedures are standardized and followed effectively. It does nobody any good to kind of hint at them or grin at them or nod to them uh, when, they, when they get close to a correct answer. You're creating demand characteristics and it's particularly important in, in testing personality to stay away from that. Among other things because it also then impacts the norms on which the the tests themselves have been, um, have been established. In most instances these tests are normed on normal people. There's one exception that I'll cite when we, um, when we get to that. The issues of reliability and validity are always at hand and we do need to worry about them. Um, there are also a couple of issues that really relate to the people who are taking the tests and these I think are worth, are worth mentioning also. One of them that might occur to you as you're, as you're taking a test is, can somebody actually fake a socially desirable answer? Can you appear to be um, um, more pleasant or more well-adjusted than you actually are in a given situation? And the answer is, it depends on the test. One of the traditional tests that I'll show you here does have scales in there that tap into whether you're in fact uh, taking the test straightforward and honestly or not. And the other uh, has to do with another question that might occur to you and that is, well, how, what are you really measuring here? Do you want to know how I feel right now or are you really talking about me in the long range? What it, and the difference there is the difference your state, which is a momentary situation, as opposed to a trait which is generally you know, the, the way you normally are. So what we're doing is, is um, arguing the difference between how you usually are as opposed to how you are right now. Normally that will be handled either in the instructions to the test itself as for instance in a word association test where we will tell you to give the first word that comes to mind or the question will tip you. Um, if you remember when we talked about the, the uh, Taylor Manifest Anxiety Scale in the Motivation Emotion section of the course, I noted that some of the questions that were used there were things like, um, my sleep is usually fitful and disturbed. The use of the word usually in the question indicates that we're looking, we're asking a kind of a long-term, many-week or many-month uh, question there, not how you slept last night. So normally the instructions or the question will tip you as to what the correct answer actually is. Now, as we look at tests, 
what we're going to do is to look at three different broad classes of tests, uh, the first of which are the self-description uh, types of tests. They, and the, the classic in this, the grandparent of almost all tests, is what's called the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. For obvious reasons, we don't call it that. We simply refer to it as the MMPI. It is in a new edition as of the late 1990s, um, and therefore it is now referred to, the new version is referred to as the MMPI-2. It's based on between 550 and 600 statements that most people can answer true or false, although there is a third possible response option, and that is, I really can't say. But if you, ought, if you select that option too many times when we're asking you questions as obvious as the palms of my hands are constantly sweaty. I mean, that's a yes, no question for most of us. And if, if too often you say, well, I really can't say, it invalidates the test itself. So that's one of the things that, that test administrators do check when they're, when they're looking at um, test results. For copyright purposes, I cannot show the score sheet, which is on the flip side of the page you're writing on at the moment. But I'm going to be talking about the, the, um, the MMPI summary sheet, which is included in, in the simple psych book. Uh, can anybody call a page number for me right there, and I can just cite it for people? Um, just the number on the right is all I need. 10. 10. On page 10 in this section of the book is the, is the sheet that I'm talking to now. Um, on the left, there are three validity scales, which are measures of, of the actual truth value of the measures that are in the test. Um, the F scale is a validity scale that includes items that are not usually accepted either by people who we would consider normal or by people who are mentally ill. Um, second is the K or correction scale, um, which detects faking either good or bad. And the L or lie scale detects or is based on socially desirable but wrong answers. For instance, one of the items that loads on the L scale is, I do not like everyone I know. And in essence, that's an item that almost all of us would have to answer true. We don't like, you know, unlike um, Mark Twain, we never met a person we didn't like. Not true. Most of us have a, you know, kind of a rank ordering of those we really like, those we don't like so well. If too often you try to appear like a goody two-shoes and answer that question, well, of course, I, I like everybody I've ever met. You do that too many times on the questions on the load on that factor that are sprinkled through the 550 or 600, and it will invalidate your test. If you look at the scoring sheet there, you will see that there is a heavier line around the 30th percentile and the 70th percentile. Normally, it is an acceptable score if it's within the 30 to 70 range. That is, on the three validity scales, they have to be within that range in order not to invalidate the test. So if any one of those three scales bounces outside that upper heavy line into the upper, upper region there, it invalidates the test as a whole. That is, because you have not passed the validity scales, um, there is reason to suspect the truth value of the answers you've given on this, the 10 clinical scales that are, that are actually involved. So in essence, um, when we talk about the scoring, this test has been so well researched down through the years, there are thousands of studies, not only on the original MMPI, but its replacement, the MMPI-2. It is now, because it's a multiple choice test, essentially true, false, or cannot say, it's actually computer scored uh, in, the, um, in the normal process. The validity scales are, are analyzed first, and then we look at the, the clinical scales um, second. And it's the clinical scales that we're really interested in um, based on the, on, the, um, on the computer scoring that is, um, that is involved. Um, those 10 scales um, are listed on the, the right side of the sheet there. In general, the scales at the, at the left end, the, the HS scale, which is hypochondriasis, the D scale, which is depression, and the HY scale, which is uh, hysteria, those are the ones that, that lead to a diagnosis of neurosis in the traditional labeling system, more generally now the anxiety-based disorders. Any one scale deviating into the high range is not enough to immediately make you mentally ill or diagnosably mentally ill. The point is that here's a test where what we're really looking at is the pattern of scores across all 10 scales, okay? If you deviate high on the first three, the suspicion will be that you have an anxiety-based disorder of, of some sort. If you deviate high on the last four, the PT scale, which is psychasthenia, the SC or schizophrenia scale, the MA or hypomania scale, 
and the SI or social introversion scale, this is an indication of a, a schizophrenic disorder. Uh, and more generally, it is considered a psychotic disorder, if, or th that's where they would start looking for follow-up, if you deviate high on both the first three and the last four. An example of one scale where you might deviate given your age, that is the age of most viewers in, in the late teens, early 20s, you are still about the process of deciding who you are as an individual, and among other things, you may be examining your, your whole approach to sexuality, what kind of a person you think you are, how you deal with, with the same and members of the opposite sex, and so forth. And it's quite possible, given your age, that you might actually deviate high on the masculinity-femininity scale purely because of your age. And that would not immediately have you stuck in a mental hospital or put on tranquilizers or anything like that. We might expect that at somebody who's in, in their late teens, early 20s. Uh, so again, it's the pattern of, sc of scores that we're really looking at in this scale. Another sample, um, and I've already talked about interpretation already, another sample of this kind of a questionnaire test is Julian Roeder's internal external locus of control scale, which is a really interesting test that basically gives you a series of statements um, to which to react. And what that, what that test does is to, is to pose for you a series of about 28 or 30 pairs of statements. And the statements differ quite widely. And what you have to do for each pair is to identify with one or the other. A sample pair that I'll make up out of my head here might involve um, one of my coworkers was promoted uh, to be manager of the division of which I'm also a part. I thought my performance was as good as, as, um, as his, <coughs> but he got the promotion. I'm quite sure that happened because he married the boss's daughter. Contrasting with a similar lead-in, that is, um, a coworker of mine in the same division of my company was promoted to, to manager of the division over me when I thought my credentials were quite good. But I realize that he has also put in longer hours, has more seniority than I do, and in fact deserves that appointment based on the work he's, the contributions he's made to the company. The wording wouldn't be that obvious, but in essence, the first one that I gave you labels what is called an external locus of control. That is, I'm helpless, I can't do anything, that happened because of nothing I could control. He married the boss's daughter and got the promotion. As opposed to the second one, which is generally indi indicative of what is called an internal locus of control. He worked hard, he got it. By implication, I can work hard, I'll get the promotion next time. And across the 26 or 28 or 30 items in that test, each of them loads you as either, or identifies you as either having an internal or an external locus of control. Street people tend to have very much an external locus of control. They don't have a congressperson who represents them. They're not paying taxes. They have essentially no impact on city council, except in Atlanta when the uh, Olympics are there, and then city council simply sweeps them off the streets to clean up the city and puts them in a camp for a week over which they had essentially no control. So they, poor people, particularly the, the, the street people in a city, are very likely to have a strong external locus of control. They are very much a kind of a, um, they're at the impact, they're, they're at the control of, of society itself, more so than controlling their own destiny. But that test generally uh, is a very interesting one in terms of, of revealing people's internal versus external locus of control. The second general class of tests that we're going to look at um, among three in this, sub, in this uh, section are the projective tests. These are a very different kind of, of test of personality. They're essentially formless, unstructured tasks which are posed for you. Uh, they, the, the procedure is disguised, and oftentimes when you're taking such a test, you really don't have a clue what is actually being measured. What it does, the underlying premise is that what this test does is to present you with a deliberately ambiguous situation and force you to essentially draw on your own resources to lend structure to it. The way in which you structure it essentially becomes what we're trying to measure and one of the things that we're interested in. So these projective tests are sometimes referred to as subjective. Unlike the MMPI, which is an objective test, the, the, um, the Rorschach and the TAT, which are the two tests we're going to look at today, are basically subjective tests. They, the, the scoring suffers to a certain extent simply because it's as much a function as of the beliefs and training of the test scorer as it is of your own performance on the, um, on the test. The first one that we'll look at then, um, given the problems that we've already talked about here, is the Rorschach inkblot test. The Rorschach is composed of 10 inkblots, some of which are black and white, some of which are in full color, 
and some of which are a mix of red, black, and white. So we start out with full color ones. We have some that are red, black, and white, and then some that are black and white, or black, gray, and white, I guess I should really say. Um, you're presented each one at a time, and there are whole papers that have been written just on how to go about presenting the card. And the reason is that you don't want, in the initial question you ask, to cue the subject, the person taking the test, at all as to what kind of an answer is desired, because we really want the, the, the person to generate the answer out of their own experience. And so usually when the card is propped up, um, the probe question that is used is something like, what does this remind you of? And that is about as neutral a statement as you can make to get somebody to start free associating to the items on the, on the card. They don't want to say, you know, do you see the, the, um, the cricket over in the right corner of this picture? You don't do that. It's just a very general opening statement, essentially an invitation to free associate to a picture, an ink blot. As long as you are free associating, the test administrator will keep writing feverishly to keep up with you. There is one additional probe. When you begin to wind down and slow down, there'll be one additional probe. Is there anything else? And after you wind down a second time, that card is put away and the second one is propped up in front of you. Um, and the procedure is then completed. So we present all ten of them once for free associations. Then we go back through the cards, present them again, and now ask you, we're going to read back to you your responses for two purposes. One is to double check that we got it correctly, and secondly, to identify what feature of the picture caused you to associate in that way. The scoring, then, is rather interesting. Um, in essence, um, it involves, essentially, um, looking, first of all, at part-whole responses. That is, what element of the picture seemed to be the primary source of, of stimuli for you, uh, causing you to respond in a given way. Secondly, we're looking at response determinants. Was color important, or shading, or form, or movement, or orientation? There are a lot of different things you can pick up on in the, um, in the test. Uh, and finally, then, the content. You know, that's the one you spend all the time on. That's actually the least important of the things that the test scorer is actually looking at. The test, overall, is complex. It's subjective. Um, it's, it has a lot of latitude for scoring. There are whole volumes that have been written on how to score the book, and it still remains one of the most unreliable tests we have. Because of that, it isn't often used for measurement these days, but it's a very easy way to lead people into therapy. So it's often used in psychotherapy, not so much for measurement purposes as for, for a general introduction to, to therapy in an environment where somebody can actively control it. Finally, let's talk about the thematic apperception test, or TAT as it's typically cause, called. This one has 20 um, ambiguous pictures that are given where it isn't at all clear what's actually going on in that situation. You're given each picture and you're asked to make up a story. What led up to this situation, what's going on now, and what is the likely outcome? And those are then scored again, uh, given that it's non-standardized and, and looking primarily for recurrent themes. Um, the, um, what I'm trying to get to is the picture that we had you do a story of, and I want to read you a couple of samples of what was actually done, what has been turned in in the past here to this kind of a, a document. John and Mary haven't seen each other in four years. During that time, they have both had sex change operations. Now they're trying to decide if they still want to get married, as one that was turned in. Jack and Jill ran up the hill with Jack a little horny. Jack fell down upon the ground, and Jill refused stubbornly. Not mine. Um, Mary and Jim decided to go to the park and spend some time together and just have an all-around good time. But once they arrived, they got into a giant argument. Jim hated Mary's sunglasses and told her to take them off. She refused, so Jim tore them from her face. Just as he pulled the sunglasses off, she lost a contact. They both started crawling around in the grass looking for it and eventually came face to face. Jim apologized and Mary paused for a moment deciding whether or not to accept it. She did so and they lived happily ever after because since Mary was blind in one eye she couldn't see Jim's bad side. My favorite was the following. 42,712,616, 42,712,616, Forty two million seven hundred twelve thousand six hundred and 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 nineteen twelve damn one two three and so forth. In general, what we find in these pictures, uh, given the age of the people, is stories about separation anxiety or a job or schooling opportunity that is going to separate the couple as one general theme. The other is um, she's pregnant and they're trying to figure out what to do about it, again, given the age of the models in, in this picture. Nobody picks up on all of the elements, but you can see 
Her hands are in the more sheltered position. Her shoulders are in the more closed position. They're both looking at the ground rather than each other, suggesting the problem is as yet unresolved. And given the, the um, expression on their faces, it is, a, it, is a, um, um, it is a serious discussion that is actually occurring there. So that's the thematic apperception test, another example of a, of a subjective test with non-standardized scoring. We'll pick up next time looking at rating and interview types of tests, the most recent types of tests we now utilize. <laughs>